Welcome to the future of fantasy consoles. Welcome to Picatron. Hmm, a new sound. Hi everybody, I'm Christian from LazyDevs Academy. Welcome to this introductory video to Picotron 0.1. Yeah, 0 0.10. So Picotron just came out. This will be a quick look. Uh, I will try to get you uh, set up and started. I will show you some resources. I will show you around ju just to how to broadly use the system. Uh, I have to spend some time myself to figure out a lot of the details and so forth. Uh, so, you know, this is just like work in progress things. We are discovering the world of Picotron as we go. But here is how to get started. Off the bat, because those videos are getting very long and a lot of people don't like, you know, watching tutorials and videos, which is fine. If you want to just jump in and get started and, and figure it out yourself, uh, there is a README TXT on the desktop when you launch Picotron, and that covers a lot of really good subjects. And that's probably also a good point to get started and figure out stuff yourself if you want to go that route. For everybody else, welcome. So I already made a video about Picotron when the uh, playground stuff came out, right? We already looked at like a preliminary version of Picotron but it was a very different beast from what we have now. This now feels a lot more complete. So Picotron, a lot of people think of Picotron as like a Super Nintendo to Pico 8's Nintendo or like a Game Boy Advance to Pico 8's Game Boy Color, right? And that's not necessarily wrong, but I think there is a lot more happening with Picotron. And also Picotron doesn't completely replace Pico 8. So I like to think about Picotron as the sequel to Pico 8 in a movie sense where the sequel doesn't replace the original. It just expands the originals both exist and uh, support each other. The term that Zep is using on a website is fantasy workstation and I like that term as well because it differentiates like the philosophy of Picotron from Pico 8. Pico 8 is a fantasy console, this is a fantasy workstation. Some people asked if this was an OS and I get that it kind of looks like an OS, right? It looks like a desktop environment. It's not, doesn't quite have that kind of reach but if you think about it as kind of like a fantasy OS, that's fine as well, I think. But anyway, enough talk, or maybe not quite just enough talk. There is one thing that I wanted to share with you that kind of like really unlocked Picotron very early on for me. And that is like this, we have to think about Picotron working a little bit differently than Pico 8. In Pico 8, when you run a program, when you run a card, right? You would load that card into memory and then you would run that card. That's how would Pico 8 would work. With Picotron, there is a bit of a nuance happening here. There's actually two different ways in which you can run a Picotron card. One is the old way. You load a card into memory and execute that card. But the other one is you can just also load that card without it being in memory. It's just like you just run it among other cards that are running in parallel. You can run a lot of cards at any given time without them being necessarily in memory, so to speak. And we can see this right away when you boot up in this desktop environment. This is almost vanilla. I have a trash folder in here that I hacked in a little bit and I don't want to get rid of it. Uh, it's so just ignore the trash folder for a while. I want to draw your attention to the top right corner. There is a bunch of icons here, right? And those icons are kind of reminiscent of the icons in the Pico 8 editor, where you can switch the editor to different modes. This works exactly the way it works in Pico 8 as well. You can click on this, and this is Picotron's code editor. You can click on this, and this is Picotron's sprite editor. And you can click on this, and this is Picotron's uh, map editor. And you can click on this, and this is Picotron's, now this is a bit different, this is now the sound effect, the instrument, and the music editor. So three functionalities combined into one. Uh, we couldn't edit instruments previously, and uh, sound effects and patterns, music patterns, were two different editors. Now everything is combined into like a overall sound editor. Now this icon here that looks, I think it always looks like, maybe it's a desk. It's, is it a table or is it like an iMac? I, th I always think it's an iMac, but maybe it's actually a table. Well, anyway, this is the desktop that we just saw before. This is also just like one of those icons over there. And then you have this, this TV icon. And when you click on that, uh, the taskbar suddenly disappears and you are in the terminal window. Now, how do I get out of that terminal window? You do that by pressing Alt. And that brings up the taskbar and you can click on one of the icons to, to get back to the other modes. But you can also press Alt and press left and right. And that allows you to jump between the different icons. Now the icons are actually called workspaces. That's the term for like this full screen um, Picotron app 
running and allowing you to do stuff. Because yes, all of these icons are not modes. They are actually Picotron apps. They are cards that are running right now. And that also means that you can create your own cards as well. You can create your own applications that will run in this place among the other tools. You can also remove tools that you don't need. In a lot of my Pico 8 projects, I actually never needed the map editor. So in this case, in Picotron, you can just right click on the map editor. It says close workspace. I'm going to close that no map editor for me right now. But also, for example, in the recent uh, shmup series, you saw me developing a lot of tools, a lot of editors for my Pico 8 shmup. And in Picotron, these could be the different modes, the different workspaces that I use to just edit my game. They could become like legitimate tools that work among the built-in tools of Picotron. And of course, and additionally, you can hack those tools, right? So if there is something about the code editor or about the sprite editor that you don't like, you don't have to beg Zap to fix that problem or to make change it or to make it different, right? You can just do it yourself now. You can create your own you know, mod of the existing editors to suit your needs. This is incredibly powerful and Oh man, I'm just looking forward to what will happen here because <laughs> we've been given the keys to the kingdom. I know this is a bit overwhelming, but I think a main takeaway that we should take away from this is that at any given point, Picotron is a whole bunch of cards already running, but not necessarily loaded into memory in a way that we can edit them. There's always just one card that you edit. Let us explore the UI a little bit more. So you see this drive lock icon here. You can double click that and that will bring up a window, a folder window, uh, that is very similar to something that you would expect from Windows. Now there's a bunch of stuff here that you probably don't have. I have two cards in here. I have Hello World P64 and Hello World P64.png. These are kind of like small test programs that I did on a stream recently. But this also shows you kind of like what cards look like in Picotron. So P64 is the extension. Previously it was P8, now it's P64. And yes, we still have the PNG version. Like we can turn each card into like a PNG and like an image and all the data will be encoded it into the image the way it was possible with Pico 8. Now again, these things you probably don't have when you launch uh, Picotron on boot, but there's a bunch of folders. There's an app data folder, there's a desktop folder, there's a RAM folder, and there's a system thing. It is also a folder. And of course, this works like any kind of UI. You can double click on the desktop folder and that brings you to the desktop folder. And a desktop folder is just the stuff that you see on a desktop. It's just like the same thing in a different window. But actually at this point, I want to bring up a little bit of a warning. This desktop environment is a little bit undercooked right now. And it is mm, some things that you think would work in the desktop actually don't work. And you quite often have to switch back to the, to the terminal. So actually the terminal window is where the action in Picotron really happens right now. And the desktop is kind of like still work in progress. I'm just giving this warning because it's very easy to get distracted by the desktop and be like, where do I find the button to do the thing? And quite often the thing is actually just in a terminal and it's not available in the desktop. But quite often something that you find is like this hamburger menu on the windows in the desktop and other situations as well, quite often hide interesting features. For example, here I can create a new file or I can create a new folder. That's pretty cool. And also this is how you create files on a desktop. You have to open the desktop in this window here and then you can create a file on the desktop. And this is weird because you cannot create a file when you're just looking at a desktop, right? Usually from Windows, I'm used to be able to just right click and create a new text file. That quite often that's how I start new projects. I create some text files on the desktop. Uh, you cannot do that. You have to open up this drive location, open up the de desktop as a window here and then here you can create new folders and new files. <laughs> a bit weird. One hidden thing that kind of fits into this vibe is um, if you click on something like this trash icon and you then click on a hamburger menu, you suddenly get a lot of more option in this hamburger menu. I tell you this hamburger, this hamburger has some secrets. So right now, for example, you can rename stuff, but there's also like this file info thing. Let's click on that. Ooh, that's actually a, a whole different Picotron app that just launched. And here you see kind of like how this element, this is actually a folder, how this element is being displayed on the desktop. And there's a whole bunch of interesting information, but it is also a, ha ha, there is an edit button. Let's click on that. And now you can, you know, give this a title, version, author, notes, and then it goes even deeper. You can edit the icon, that's right. You can edit the icon and it launches a tiny little sprite editor where you can change how the icon looks like of this thing. This is actually a folder. It used to be a folder with this icon, 
but I changed it into this like uh, into this uh, trash icon shape. And there's even some templates here if you want to get started with designing your own icons for your own stuff. And while we are speaking of stuff that's a bit hidden and fun to play around with, so in this Picotron button, the start menu button over there, uh, there is a whole bunch of stuff in here as well. You can open, what does files do? That just opens the file editor, right? You can open up the terminal if you manage to close this somehow. Uh, show messages. There's an area down at the bottom here that has some messages. This quite often has some uh, error messages. Quite often error messages will pop up there. But the thing I wanted to point out is system settings. Ooh. Yeah, so you can do some system settings here and uh, there's going to be a bit of a cursed UI element here. There's a bit of a UI crimes committed by Zep that I want to point out. This is one of the UI crimes. This is a button uh, that switches you to the second page. <laughs> this is not just an indicator which page you're on. This is clicking on here which will, will put you to the second page. Not quite how I... Very unintuitive UI element right there. Anyway, so you can here, you can decide some things how Picotron will show up. You can uh, switch it to full screen. You can, uh, this pixel perfect thing. Some people want to run Picotron uh, just filling out the entire screen on full screen. And that sometimes doesn't quite work. Uh, so turning off pixel perfect will stretch the pixels to actually, you know, fill the entire Picotron to the entire window, but it will result in a bit of a blurry pixels. So right now we don't really have good, good pixel filtering options for Picotron. I wished in the future we had more. Um, and stretch allows you to actually really just, just change the aspect ratio of, of Picotron, which I won't do now because it will break my, <laughs> my recording setup. Anyway, you can mute audio and you can change some themes. Yes, indeed, you can change themes and ooh, look at this. There's some really, really fun themes that you can work with. I work with Aqua, which is kind of like the default. I kind of want to set everything to default, but you can change things wrong. There's also wallpapers here. These are also Picotron cards. You can also design your own wallpapers. You can also design your own themes as well. Everything is possible. I'm really in love with this robot. That is a very cute, cute robot. But let's keep it to the default for now. And on the second page, the, I, I love that there is just like a network button and nothing else. <laughs> if real OSs were so simple, right? Just turn on internet. <laughs> uh, I don't know what better sa battery saver does. Uh, squishy Windows is um, <laughs> does this. We very important options <laughs> makes the Windows squishy. R Shift Magnify actually have it always on. Is if you press the right shift then you get like this magnifying glass everywhere in uh, the OS, and that's actually really nice. Uh, and also sparkles, <laughs> which apparently is very bad for compressions algorithms on YouTube. So hello, YouTube, everybody. Let's enjoy the blockiness. Uh, down here, you can have some screensavers. It, it would be great if there was a button to actually launch the screensavers. The screensavers are also Picatron cards that you can customize yourself as well. Anyway, as I said, this, there's also this readme file here that opens up a text editor and that actually shows a readme file. This is some exciting stuff. We're gonna go through this stuff in a second. But something I want to point out is that's really fun. There is an image here, but this is a text file, right? How does that work? If you click on this, you see, haha, there are some secret strings. The, the image was encoded into some kind of secret code. Uh, this is called a pod. And the pod means uh, Picotron object data. So all sorts of data in Picotron is encoded as a pod. And there's actually a lot of pod stuff in Picotron that, and there's like a pod viewer and everything. So mm, pods are a big deal. We're gonna talk about pods in the future, but I still don't quite understand pods myself. But yeah, this image is a pod and that allows you to create like this rich text kind of um, text files. Really cool for like manuals in the future. I love it. Right, so let's go back to the folder structure and let me show you some folders and what they do. So, <clears throat> as I said, desktop folder is just a desktop. Now, the system folder is actually all of Picotron. Uh, it's, it's right there in here. You can edit everything about Picotron in here. For example, in apps, you find all of those editors in the workspaces, like the code editor, the sprite editor, everything. All of these are in here. So this is the code editor. This is the sprite editor. This is the map editor. This is the sound editor. This is the actual terminal. You can hack the terminal window if you want to. This is the settings uh, thing that we just looked at. This The settings that we just saw. This is also a Picotron card. This is the about window, about Picotron. If you launch this, about Picotron, this window here, that is this card. And there's also a viewer for pods. This is called the pod tree. We can, we can double click it and launch it and it just launches. It doesn't load into memory. 
again, it doesn't load into memory. It just launches a copy of that and it runs among the other things that are running right now. Uh, there is also a theme editor. So the themes that we are switching between, you can actually create your own themes in here. You can customize the colors and everything. And <laughs> yes, 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 the rabbit hole expands. Oh no, I changed my theme. I want to change back. Yeah, even like the file windows, like the file, that, like this window that we're looking at, this 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 folder view, right? That even is also its Picotron card. It's here. It's file left sixty four. You can edit this crazy, crazy stuff. But don't worry. I, I mean, you can break a lot in this folder. But whatever you edit and whatever you change, actually, when you reboot the system, it will revert to original uh, already. So everything here is kind of like set in stone. You can look at it. You can tweak with this. But when you restart Picotron, it will be back to normal. And yeah, you have some demos in here that you can look at. You have some fonts. There are some fonts in here. There's actually a Pico 8 font in here. Uh, you have screensavers in here. So here you could like look at how the screensavers work and create your own. Here are the themes. And here are the wallpapers that we just saw. And so forth. So most of the Picotron stuff, most of the built-in Picotron stuff is hidden in system. But as I said, this stuff gets reset when Picotron reboots. So how do you create your own stuff that actually stays? That is what app data is for. So in an app data folder, you have the system folder. And this is your own custom stuff. So you can customize everything about the, the system in here. And I think what basically happens is that folders get merged, kind of like on start. But uh, you know, the details, how exactly that works is something we're going to hash out in a future video. I haven't messed myself with this stuff too much. Rest assured, if there's anything that you want to do that is custom that you want, want it to stay, put it in an AppData folder and not in the system folder. But yeah, you can see there are some pods in here, right? There's settings pod, that's the settings of my Picotron. There's a theme pod, that's a theme that I just set up. There's a startup Lua. This is code that is being executed when Picotron boots. I can uh, set it up so certain standard default apps launch on boot. There's also a weird folder called Desktop 2. Wh wh what's that? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff in Desktop 2. Where is Desktop 2? Well, <laughs> there's a hidden desktop. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Yeah, so you can move the task down here and there's like this extra space that you can use to stash some things. I put some um, some tools that I want to talk about later on in here. This should be empty on a default Picotron installation. There's also some widgets running here. You will, you will be able to run some widgets up here. Uh, these are also Picotron cards. But anyway, how do you make cards, right? So let's go out and let me show you the last folder that we haven't talked about, which is the RAM folder. This is just the current card that has been loaded into RAM. Yes, so each Picotron card is now a whole folder that and when you export it, when you save it, then gets compressed and squished into a single file. But when you load it into RAM, it gets extracted, so to speak, it gets unpacked, and it's in this folder. So you can open up RAM, and all of the stuff that is in the current Picotron card that you're editing will be here in this RAM folder. There's a whole bunch of folders here that I frankly don't quite understand just yet. But I think the folder that we're most interested in is the card folder in here, the subfolder. There's a main Lua file. This is where your code starts. But you can have multiple Lua files in here that reference each other. There's a graphics folder where that has a graphics file. There is a map folder that has a map file. And there is a sound effect folder that has a sound effect file. And again, all of these you can have multiples of. You can have multiple sound effect files. You can have multiple graphics files. You have, can have multiple map files. How do I edit this? Well, as I said, you just use the editors, the workspaces that are loaded in here. Actually, I, I, I did I, 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 closed, <laughs> I closed the map editor. Let me bring this back. OK, so. Um, let me uh, look at the code editor. So this code editor, as you can see, it's already editing the main Lua of the card that you are currently editing. So you can already start coding right away. You can create more tabs, and each tab will be its own Lua file. Previously, we had uh, in Pico 8, we had multiple tabs, but they were all the code was in the end all saved into the same file. But now there's multiple files, so you can click on this this tab and you can over open different files so you can create new files in your cart right you can see here that we are in the ram so we are editing the current cart right now right and the same thing with the graphics editor for example the sprite editor you can see that it uh, currently has opened the 0.gfx this default graphics file and you can have create or edit more graphics files in their own tab, so you can edit multiple sprite sheets at the same time. And you can see that in the map editor, the map editor also has its own map file, and you can see that it's actually also referencing uh, the graphics file. So it 
pulls the sprites from the graphics file and creates a map with that. And yeah, same thing with the sound editor. It also has a zero SFX open right now and you can create more files if you want to in the same card. Okay, so let's get started. Let's do it like a hello world. And I'm gonna say it right away because people are very intimidated by Picotron. It's like, ooh, this, this is a whole new beast. It's not. Like a lot of things that work in Pico 8 just straight up work in, in Picotron. It's the same thing. So let's go. Function init. And we created an init function. This gets executed at the beginning of the card. Let's go function draw. We created a draw file and that will be just drawn at 60 frames per second. We have function update. We created an update function. This also gets executed at 60 frames per second. Actually, there is in Pico 8, there was a differentiation between update and update 60. Picotron is just update because it's always 60 frames per second. Right, so how does that work? Well, in, in, in draw, you, we'd used to do CLS to clear the screen, right? And then we do a print and we do hello world. And that's gonna be it. I'm gonna save this, control save, saves the cartridge as untitled P64. I'm gonna run this and there we go, hello world. Now let's go to the terminal real quick. I'm gonna actually, I don't like the untitled thing. So in the terminal, we're gonna go save uh, my first cart dot P64. And there we go, we saved my cart. I'm gonna do a, uh oh, a Picotron just crashed. <laughs> Did it save my file? Did it save my file? It did not save my file, but it has untitled 64. I think this is this is the one that it has. Mm. Yes, Picotron is very unfinished right now. It's it's an early alpha, right? So it crashes a lot. So you save your files a lot and, and be patient. Be prepared for lots of crashes. And also it's very easy to mess up Picotron, right? It's very easy to change some settings, modify something, and suddenly nothing works as it ex expected. And you want to restart Picotron. There is not even no reboot. You cannot reboot Picotron. It doesn't have this command. You have to actually close the window and re restart it. So uh, a lot of things work weirdly or uh, maybe they're not even not in place. I'm gonna show you some things that are just like plainly missing. Uh, so yeah, it's it's still a work in progress. We can do a lot with it, but also be careful. Anyway, let's, let's, let's see if how much survived. So this is how we load a cart. And now it was been loaded into RAM slash cart. Oh, actually, yeah, yeah, okay, so. Ha, that's good to know. So this stuff is actually not the cart. This is the cart. I'm learning as we speak. Only the actual cart folder in the RAM is the actual cart. Okay, good, good to know. All right, but our hello world worked. So uh, let me let me continue with my idea. So let's save my first cart.p64. And now it has been saved, cool. Right, and so like a lot of things that you expect from Pico 8 to work, work here as well. For example, the colors, the first uh, 16 colors, you can see them here. The first 16 colors up here, they are just the Pico 8 colors. So if I want to use, I don't know, our beautiful blue as the background color, you can just do that. You can do CLS1, that used to be the blue. We're gonna run this and you have a beautiful dark blue color. If you want to use the iconic Pico 8 red as the background color, you can set it to eight and that will be just the, just the red color. <laughs> That's a little bit extreme. Let's set it back to blue. I think this is kind of like pleasant. Okay, now let me show you, you know, all the other things that you would do in a card. For example, let's make a sprite. Let's go to the sprite editor. This is a bit of an expanded version of that original Pico 8 editor. You have two swatches here. You can, this is the, basically the same palette, but presented in a different way. This is more of a Pico 8 friendly view, I think, because the uh, old Pico 8 colors are on, in the top row. Uh, this is more of an artistically sorted color palette. So you can pick colors, you know, de depending on the hue and value and so forth, but you might easily drift into colors that are unique to Picotron. Because the second row of colors in here, uh, this looks like the alternate Pico 8 colors, but they're not. Some of them are, but some of them are unique to Picotron. Like for example, this 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 magenta, that's his, that's his Picotron. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of purples in here that I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited about. Uh, but anyway, yeah, let's let's just let's just keep things Pico 8 friendly. Let's just make a red smile. Let's not smiley face. Let's make a red heart shape. Right, something like this. I created a little sprite. Now, something to you to notice immediately is like this is not an eight times eight sprite. This is a sixteen times sixteen sprite. Ooh, we have bigger sprites now. Not only that, each sprite sheet 
can have now sprites of different sizes. So this is a 1660 by sprite. Now the next sprite, I want to go back to original Pico 8. Just going to type an 8 in here, 8 and enter, always press enter, it's easy to miss that. And that will just reset it back to the you know original Pico 8 size. Ooh, yeah, that's nice. So the preview window here, this, this, this sprite selector here, actually shows sprite as different resolutions. So this is not no longer like a huge image that gets split into eight times eight sprites. This is just a collection of differently sized sprites. And as you saw, you can even have non-square sprites. Anything is possible. Right, so we created these things. I'm gonna save this. We can do now SPR zero, and then we're gonna put it 6464. Hey! It's weird to get used to the tabs. <laughs> Save, run, and there's our heart. It's just, just like normal Pico 8. It's just like Pico 8. And there's the, the weird blue squiggle that we did. <laughs> anyway, let's look at the, uh, the map. So the, the map is now full of hearts. I'm gonna include some, some things that are not hearts, so just weak, so, <laughs> so see some, some structure. And that works the same way. That just works the same way. I'm gonna comment this out. And yeah, let's just draw the entire map to the screen. It's, there's nothing to it, it just works. I mean, there's some things to it, but like uh, the basic functionality is the same as it was in Pico 8. Now there are some small catches here. I think the map editor is the most undercooked of them all. For example, as I said, it was re it's always referencing the zero, the GFX, but if you have a different file, different sprite file, then there's no way of making it show that different sprite file. That's not possible. Another thing that's not possible is like, look, we have an eight time eight sprite, but that doesn't fill out the entire space in here. And you'd be like, okay, because we already used 16 times 16 sprites, but no, this editor actually defaults to 16 times 16. Like if you want to make a map, you have to make it with 16 times 16 sprites. There is a way to set it to eight times eight and, and you know other sprite sizes, but you have to get into pod file modding. Yeah, but there is no built-in functionality to change the size of the tiles in the map editor. You see there is a layer size up here, but I think that refers to just the size of the entire map. Mm, you can create multiple layers, interestingly, and this, uh, this skull icon removes a layer. <laughs> if you were wondering about that. Yeah, weird stuff, weird stuff. Uh, anyways, let's talk about music. Now, personally, I think in the music stuff, we see the biggest departure from Pico 8. There's the least um, you know, common ground between Pico 8 and the music editor. The main part of it is that we now have to create our own instruments. This didn't used to be the case. Pico 8 came with just some predefined instruments and you just would just use them and that was it. Now you have to create all instruments from scratch. There is an instrument tab in here and this just gives you like a whole bunch of instrument slots, 24 by default. But remember, you can always create more SFX files, right? It's, there's no, no limit, so to speak. Anyway, those instruments are all the same. So there, there's no presets like there was in Pico 8 where you started out with a whole bunch of different things to try out. It's all just blank and you have to create your own things. And this is a bit of a learning curve. I wish there was, it, it came out with a Pico 8 Prince instruments preloaded. So there was a bit of a common ground there. And yeah, this part, this editor, this instrument editor, this is, this is, this is a whole rabbit hole on itself. So I'm not a musician as always, <laughs> but I'm gonna try to share with you some tricks that I found. There is some serious UI crimes happening here as well. Okay, so basically each instrument is a like there's like a bass instrument like a bass element so to speak and then uh, you stack on top different generators and modifiers and they will together create a tone a, uh, a wave that evolves over time right so you can hear how it's uh, how it sounds not by pressing space space will do nothing you actually have to use the uh, qwr and so forth, the keys that are in the top left corner of the keyboard that are mapped to the different notes on a keyboard on a piano. So this will play the different notes, right? So you can hold a note and you can see like a preview of the wave that's being generated here, right? So we have like in the bass instruments um, controls stuff like the volume, you know, you can tweak the tone so it sounds a bit off tone, right? So let me... So you can change a little bit the tone. Uh, you can bend it, which I think is the same as tone, but softer. 
giving you a bit more fine control. Um, and then in this case, this instrument, this default instrument uses a carrier. Basically, this is an oscillator, I think, that just generates a wave. And you can see the shape of the wave in here in this preview window. And with this knob, you can change the shape of the wave. So usually it's like this triangle wave, but I can change it, for example, to a sine wave. And you can hear what it sounds like as you turn a knob. So it switches from a sine to a square to a, uh, uh, to a uh, step square wave, right? And that actually covers a lot of the Pico 8 uh, instruments that were available. A lot of Pico 8 instruments were just different positions on this one knob. In fact, I will show you a file that um, where I, together with the community and, you know, huge shout out to Smelly Fish Sticks, who actually did a lot of work on this, um, where most of the instruments are can be created just with this one knob. There is a couple of instruments that need uh, more work. But yeah, just to give you an example, I have to actually use the image as a reference. So turning this into 64 or 63, I guess, uh, that's just the red instrument in Pico 8, like the very first instrument. That's actually what it starts out with. But then turning it up to 114, that is the orange instrument. 127 or 28, around that, that point, that is the yellow instrument. Okay, so it looks like the current, my current audio pipeline kind of garbles up the sound a little bit. So I will have to figure out a different way to process the sound in the future. Sorry about that. And 192, that is the green instrument. Finally, 217, that is the blue instrument. Okay, so far so good. There is some Pico 8 stuff that you can recreate very quickly in here. But of course, this is Picotron, so we want to see some new stuff. So. Hmm. So with these buttons here, first UI crime, not a big crime, but kind of like weird. With these buttons here, you can add more effects or instruments to the stack and they will all modify each other. So for example, uh, I'm going to use an FX modifier. This blue box is an effect that we applied to this oscillator now because that's why it's like offset by one, right? And then let's do a, an echo, for example. So by default, it's off, but we're going to crank up so, some of those. Nice, huh? I'm going to make it a different wave. I, I like this, the pleasant, pleasantness of the default sign. Right, and you can be, like, change the delay to be really extreme. Or to be like very subtle. So it sounds more like a, like in a room, right? And then we can crank up the volume. You can see like the off, like the visualization of the echo here. Weird stuff. Uh, by clicking on these labels here, you can change the type of the effect or generator you're having here. For example, this um, filter it gives you a low pass and high pass filter. I mean, lots of knobs that you can play around with. All right, two major UI crimes that I wanted to share with you. First is, you see those envelopes on the side, like those additional instruments? Well, those are like additional generators or so to speak that you can map to any knob. You can attach them to any knob that you see on the screen. And that's not apparent. Actually, right now, one is connected to one knob. You see the volume that has this little white label with a blue letter in it. That actually means that this instrument, this envelope zero, is actually mapped to the volume. So actually this generator here controls the volume. And I think the idea here is that this is uh, ADSR, so attack, decay, sustain, and release, I think. This is a common idea in synthesizer, wave synthesis, where it's like there's like a curve, there's like uh, four different stages of how a tone plays. There is attack, which is the phase where you know the initial uh, trigger of a tone that goes up. Then there is like um, decay. So after the initial trigger, the tone decays a little bit. There is sustain, which is like the the volume level, so to speak, of the tone as it's as as, as long as you keep the button pressed. That's the sustain. And then when you release the button, then you get the release drop off, right? And you can here with those knobs, you can control how long these things are. So right now we have zero attack. Uh, then 40, I guess, milliseconds. I'm not sure what these numbers are, but a little bit of a decay. So for example, let's crank this up a little bit. 
let's crank up attack and let's make a longer attack, which will take longer for the, for the tone to rise in volume because this is attached to volume. See now the tone rises slowly because we have a very long attack. Short attack means that the sound triggers immediately. Bring it down again. Now there's a bit of attack, so the tone fades in a little bit. And then if you bring it back to zero again, we get the immediate trigger. Now these envelopes, these additional generators, these also can be shifted into different modes. <laughs> you see, this is crazy, right? And LFO, it means that this is like a waveform generator and you can change the frequency. Frequency and phase. You know, phase just shifts the tone. So basically what it does now, it, the, the tone don't have, is always triggered and just like oscillates, right? Weird stuff. Um, I think this is the most intuitive if you never did anything like this, because you can just draw the envelope, right? Like this is kind of like, you can decide how a tone evolves over time. So let's do like a very big attack and a very sudden delay. And then we can just make it very short. With no delay whatsoever, but we can also make a very long delay. Uh, not delay, a very long sustain or drop off. So yeah, you can draw how a tone evolves over time. Now there's speed, uh, LP1, LP2, and two. I think these control, I'm not sure what these control. I think these control what, like how how fast this thing plays through and also like there's a loop beginning and loop end, so to speak, that you control here. Not, don't quite understand how this works. But as I said, all of these, there's like multiple versions of, can have multiple envelopes at this in the same tone. All of these can be mapped to any one of those knobs. And you do this by drag and dropping the title of the generator to a knob. So let me drop it on tune. So I'm gonna change this to a, an LFO. Let's increase the frequency. Somehow this doesn't work. Oh yeah, because we have to crank up the tune because this gets multiplied or added. I'm, I'm sure, let's crank up the tune. Yeah, yeah. Crazy stuff, yeah. Like just by drag and dropping those envelopes to different knobs, you can generate crazy stuff and you can stack multiple effects on top of each other. Yeah, let's add some echo on this. FX and then echo. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm, this is, this is a whole tutorial waiting to happen and I'm not sure if even I'm the person who do this kind of tutorial. This is just like a lot, right? Um, I want to show you one last thing, which is a bit of a, another UI crime. And that is, <laughs> this is a button. <laughs> this is a button. <laughs> I'm gonna go to a new instrument. Clicking on this will change the generator in a different mode. <laughs> now it generates noise. <laughs> I mean, sure, yeah. And so now this is a noise generator. Uh, one cool trick that I saw, um, so uh, if you play this noise, there is a looping sound happening that sounds like a broken machine, right? You can fix this. Shout out to Forbes on the Pico8 Discord who showed me this. So let's see, I think we need to do a mod. And I think FM mod, and we're gonna set it to uh, uh, to like volume two, and we set it also to noise. And now you get a nice noise that doesn't sound like a broken machine. Uh, it, it, the, I'm not exactly sure how it works, to be honest. I think we have two noise generators and we layer on them on top of each other or we make one modify the other and that kind of like um, breaks up the, the repetition. But yeah, a lot of unknowns here. But once you create an instrument, so we have an instrument, right? Do we have one? Yeah, this crazy instrument that we have, it's instrument number zero. From then on, things get a little bit easier, things get a little bit more like Pico 8. You can just draw your, instru your, your melody here. And you can play your sound effects and so forth. You can change the speed and looping and so forth. I think the, I heard that the different effects like arpeggio and so forth, I think they might not be working quite right. Might not be working. 
not exactly sure, uh, but yeah, this this looks very familiar. Down here you can set the volume. Good stuff. And now, of course, then you can use those sound effects and you can arrange them into patterns the way you used to. But now you have eight channels for that. Oh, <laughs> that feels good. That feels good. But anyway, let's get out of sound effects and let's just play them in our cart, right? So did we save this? Let's save this. And then how do we play this? Well, just let's just play it on in it. SFX zero. Let's go, baby. It just works. Right, so here's how you create sprites, draw them to the screen, how you create maps and draw them to the screen, how you create sound effects and play them. Everything is just as expected, just as it was in Pico 8, but it runs off this crazy system in the background. Now, you might be asking, you know, but okay, I said you can have multiple sprite sheets. How do you access those multiple sprite sheets? Well, that's where you get into Picotron and we're gonna deal with that later. But for now, this is, I think, plenty of space to get started, to, to get started developing stuff in Picotron. But I do want to address some Picotron specific things. So again, we're gonna go back to this readme file because there's some interesting things happening here. Now, for example, you can run Picotron apps in different video modes. So the one that we saw just now was like the vid zero video mode, right? But you can also run it into in smaller resolutions, which are more, you know, compatible with Pico 8 stuff. So let's copy these out. I'm gonna get back into code and those have to be called in init. So we have vid three and vid four. With three is kind of like the half resolution mode. I'm gonna turn off that sound effect. <laughs> but anyway, so now the pixels are a lot more chunky and I think this is a mode that works very well with Pico 8 because it's the screen is a bit bigger than Pico 8, but uh, a Pico 8 application would look nice in this resolution, would be kind of like nice and centered and filling out a lot of the space. Uh, but you can also set it in vid4 mode. It's just like this vid command here, right? And that creates a very low resolution uh, uh, Picotron app. Save, run. Yeah, big chunky pixels, very much reminiscent of the chunky pixels of Pico 8, but actually resolution even smaller than Pico 8, just 90 pixels in height, but much wider than, than Pico 8. So a bit of a weird resolution that you cannot run Pico 8 content in this, uh, but it also has kind of Pico 8 vibes. So oh. now something I said is that you can run Picotron cards in, uh, in a window as well, right? So how do we do that? Well, again, we refer back to this text file, this, this um, readme tech txt that has this function called window. And instead of the vid, we just do it in the window. And then we have to specify width and default width and height of the window. Uh, <clears throat> let's go 128, 128. That's a familiar resolution. I'm gonna save this, we're gonna run this. And you can see now our program runs a little window on the desktop, yay. And of course you can re resize this window and you see more of the, of the <laughs> of the display you can put it anywhere this is cool now of course something that you might be asking is like okay but can i make it so that people can't resize the window or can i just mess around like what else can i do here there, and this is where we get into the part where you know there's no documentation about picotron just yet we are trying to figure out by looking at the already existing cards and, and like reverse engineering the information um we found out for example that you can supply this window function with a with an object and here you can uh, have access to some more options. So for example, uh, height uh, is 128. Width is also 128, but let's say, for example, we can also set the title now. Title, my other summer app. And also, for example, we can also set, um, set it so that you cannot resize the window. Resizable, I think it's the, that thing. Let's see if that works. It was false. Let's try that. Like this, this is correct, right? The tabs, the tabs will, oh man, the tabs. <laughs> I get to have to get used to the tabs. Let's save this run. And now we have my awesome app. And now we can also see that you cannot resize the window. It sh still shows you the, the cursor, but it doesn't work anymore now. Cool. All right, so this is now our beautiful cart. How do we do it when we want to export this? One major thing that you always have to do whenever you export a cart to share it with other people in Pico 8 that you also have to do in Picotron is to capture the cart image. And you do that by this time around by pressing, was it Control or Alt 7? Let's try, Alt 7? Nope, Control 7. There we go, capture the label of the cart now. I'm gonna save this. Oh, that's funny. It <laughs> Okay, now the, the terminal 
<laughs> the terminal is the different resolution mode now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the Picatron life right now. Okay, so load my first card. Dot p64. Just making sure that everything is still there. Yeah, my awesome app. Cool, cool, cool. Right. So exporting works. There, there is, there is no export function sadly. So instead, what you have to do is save uh, my first card. Dot p64. Dot png. And that will save it into like this PNG format where all the data is encoded into an image. In fact, you can see this in Windows. This is what it looks like in Windows. There we go. There's my uh, beautiful, beautiful Picotron card with the uh, captured card image. You can see there is no data down here though. How do we get data down there? Well, I already shown you how. So the way you do this is you open this up. So this is the, it, it would be nice if the text would <laughs> would deal with those files a little better. But anyway, so yeah, I'm gonna click on this card here. That's the PNG version. I'm gonna go do file info and yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. And then you click edit and here you can change all the stuff. So I'm gonna type in my over some card. I'm gonna click on save and there it is. There's the information right there already updated in the PNG. Something to watch out for is that this has been only saved in the in the PNG version of the card and not in the P64 version of the card. This is the same problem that we had with Pico 8. Anytime you shift from the P8 to the P8.png version, you will you kind of like bifurbicate the, <laughs> the program, right? So you have to make sure that you reload that again. So the say the changes that you made are saved in the future. So something I would do right now is that just to make sure I would go load my first card dot p64 dot png to load the card with this additional information that we just um, edited, and then I'm gonna save this as my first card dot p64 so the regular 64 version also retains this new information all right so let me reboot picotron real quick all right so we have now a very a fresh card there's nothing happening in the sprite sheet and anything right and i'm just going to run now this picotron card that we just created double click here and it runs my awesome app now as i said in the very beginning this runs this app in this window but it's not loaded into RAM. In RAM, the RAM is still empty. We can now work on a different card while our old card is still running and helping us maybe somehow by showing us a bunch of hearts. <laughs> cool stuff this is basically most of it uh, I want to show you now some tricks to get you started to find out you know how the advanced features work one simple trick one simple way of how you can you know understand you know the new functionality of Picatron is just to look at existing cards and it's a bit cumbersome to always have to load them into RAM isn't there an easier way yes of course there is so when you have a p64 card for example this one here uh, you can just like in this editor, in this window here, you can just go into this add address bar here and add a slash on top. And that just like puts you in the folder of the card without having to load it into RAM. And now you can explore the folder of the card and see what's happening. For example, there's a main Lua here, huh? Let's double click on that. And that just opens up the main Lua uh, this is not part of the card that you're currently editing, not the part of the card that's in the RAM. It's just some different file on your system. You can load that into the code editor as well. So you can now explore the code of a card that is not being loaded currently. Now in this case, it's a familiar code, we just wrote it, right? But you can also explore the code of uh, you know the apps that are bundled with Picotron. So as I said at the beginning, let's go to system, let's go to apps, let's say I want to explore the code of the map editor. I'm gonna click on this, I'm gonna go to address bar, I'm gonna add a slash, and this puts me inside that editor and I can see that it consists of a whole bunch of different Lua files and I can see what's happening. What's Lua, what's main.lua? Double click on that and that brings up, oh, interesting. That's the code of the, uh, the map editor exposed right here and there's even some nice comments, interesting. So this stuff can help you to like reverse engineer, you know, some of the functionality in Picotron. Something that you cannot do in desktop app, and that's is really painful to me, I think, is that you cannot load stuff into RAM here. That's weird, right? So if you're loading, if you want to load stuff into RAM to edit it and so forth, you just cannot do it. If you double click on a file, it will run the file, but it won't load it into RAM. If you want to load stuff into RAM, you have to go to the terminal. That's why I said terminal is kind of like the place where stuff actually happens.
But of course, if you want to reverse engineer Picotron, you are not alone. There's a lot of people trying to do this as well, and they actually created already some really awesome tools that will help you out. So give, let's give you let's give me a tour of some of the things that I just stumbled across. This is not an exhaustive list of things that are happening in the community right now, but some good things that I think you should know about. All right, so let me get out these bad boys. Hmm, so what is happening here? Well, one thing I really am excited about is this nview.p64. So this is something that you can get from the BBS, from the Alexa Lawful forums. Uh, this is by Sophie Holden, and she made this beautiful, oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, this basically shows you all of the functions in Picotron right now that are available right now. It just like scans the environment and just like checks all of the functions and you can see everything that you can do in Picotron in the API. For example, here's the map function that we just used, right? That's, that's just like here. Now, this tool won't explain what it does, but it shows you that it exists and what kind of parameters it accepts. Although I think in this case, I don't know, there's, I think there's more parameters to map. So I'm not sure how that works. This can be used as a kind of a simple cheat sheet quite often just with the names of the, of the different functions. You can kind of guess what, how they work and what they do. So this is really useful. And the function tool by Newsan is kind of like a similar tool that does the same thing, but slightly different. So this runs in full screen mode. So now we are in a workspace, so we have to switch with, with Alt and uh, left and right. We have to switch to different things. So it may be not quite as useful or not quite as convenient, right? But uh, it basically does the same thing. You can, you can just see all of the functions. And if a function is something that is actually somewhere in a um, Picotron cart, on, in the system folder, it will actually show you the actual function. So you can see how it works, right? It doesn't apply to all of the functions. Obviously, there's a bunch of functions here that are in C, they're written, they're kind of built into Picatron in a way that is not hackable. And in this case, you don't see the code. But of course, these are all tools that are just there to, you know, analyze the raw data, you know, just, just spit out all the names of the different functions. There's also efforts by the community to crowdsource the documentation, so we reverse engineer together everything what all those functions do. One developer I want to point out in particular is Scrap Savage, and uh, he, made a, um, he made a wiki on GitHub. And it's, it's like a collection of JSON files that just encode like a library of, of information about Picatron. Now this library is currently empty, but you can access the wiki directly from Picatron. So he made it like a little tool that you can just double click here and it just opens up a wiki right here in Picatron. You can browse the different topics and you know, most of the stuff is just really just bare bones, just like this just came out a couple of days ago, right? So people haven't contributed too much to the stuff yet, but if you want to contribute, I would suggest starting here rather than going to fandom. You know my opinions about fandom. I don't have to spell it out. I also want to point out that Scrap Savage also works on a text editor that's really cool, like a code editor called Slate. That is a really nifty tool that is essentially very similar to the built-in code editor of Picatron, but this one works in a window and has a bunch of really cool other functionalities. You just have to check it out. It's one of those um, big projects that we saw popping up in the early days of Picotron. Really cool stuff, check it out. And finally, one thing that I think a lot of people are asking is, can we play Pico8 stuff in here? You cannot. There is no way to play Pico8 files in Picotron yet. <laughs> We are working on this, okay? Uh, let me show you a real cool uh, tool. So this is called Sprimp, Sprite Importer, and is also available on the BBS. This was created by Pencilor and it, it has evolved quite a bit and it's gonna evolve even more. This is like a preliminary version here. So what you can do here is you can import it. It started out as a way to import sprite data just by, by copying and pasting it into into picotron and i think it still does that but now <laughs> so let me show you i have my cowshmap.p8 and i can just drag and drop it into this and bam more of my sprites are here and i can save them as a graphics file and i can also save the map so let me just do that real quick i'm gonna save this uh, i'm gonna actually overwrite this can i do this i think i have to reload yeah, there we go. That's my sprite sheet now imported into Picotron. Ooh. And now I'm gonna save the map file as well. I'm gonna just overwrite the other map. Again, closing up the thing because it doesn't update automatically. Another thing that is still not working. Close the tab, open up the map. And boom, that's the map from my cart. And the cool thing is that this map is actually also like the uh, tile size is set correctly. These are eight times eight tiles. So the map actually looks correctly without any gaps in between. 
Ooh. But the pace of development is so fast. This tool is already kind of outdated. It will be probably outdated by the time I release this video. The newest version I saw from Pencilor is actually just directly exports the P64. So it actually converts the P8 into P64. And then Pencilor is also working on like a wrapper that actually runs the code. I saw Celeste running in a window in Picotron already. It's, it's a bit janky still. But we're getting there. We're getting there. Oh, ho, 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 ho. yes, yes, yes. So, you know, community is working hard on the resources. As you saw, you know, lots of this stuff is not finished yet. There's lots of bugs still. Uh, but also, this is a huge playground, very exciting development. And you can start working and developing your own tools already. In a couple of days since the release, I already saw that you can upload P64 files to the BBS already, so to the Lexilofl forums, you can upload your cards there. And the cards will already play in the browser in uh, on the BBS. Now, let's talk about some things that are missing that we don't quite have in Picotron yet and probably will come later down the line. One thing that's missing is you don't have full export. So yes, you can export things in a way that will allow you to upload them to uh, the BBS and other people who own Picotron will be able to play those things but you don't have HTML export and you don't have, you know, um, standalone player export. So if you want to create games with it that are uploaded to itch.io, that doesn't work. Not right now. It will work in the future. It's on the roadmap. It's just not, wasn't the focus right now. Another thing that's not there yet, or I don't know if it will ever be there, is Splore. Like there's no way to browse the BBS cards from Picotron directly. Although it seems like, you know, because we have like the, the wiki, right? And the wiki was already interacting with the internet, right? So it, it seems to me like we might even hack it into place, right? It doesn't seem like such a big deal. You definitely can load BBS cards directly into Picotron just by using a load command. There's like little code snippet under each card on the BBS and you can just type in load hashtag and so something and that will just make Picotron download the file automatically from the BBS into memory. Finally, one thing that's missing is also official documentation. There is no official documentation and I think it will be a while until we get one. I mean, we have the readme file, right? Um, but until then, it will be very important to focus, to rely very much on the community-driven stuff. One thing that's a bit of a challenge for me as I'm, I'm working with this is kind of like, I'm not sure which of the stuff is actually stuff that is subject to change in the future and which of the stuff is stuff that is that Zep basically created and it went like, okay, and you guys do the rest, you know? Because it's like, okay, obvious stuff. In the map editor, right? You cannot change the graphics file that this editor uses. So is that something that will change later? Like will be, there be an updated version of, of this editor by Zep? Or is it up to us to now edit this in here? Like who's responsible for this, right? Sorry for the Discord sounds. Yeah, so who's responsible for, for developing and pro progressing stuff further is a little bit ambiguous right now. It would be nice to have like maybe a, like, a, like a rules of conduct, like a like a policy by Zep, you know, to, to define like wh where, is, where, is, where are the boundaries between what Zep is doing and what the community is doing. Do we have to do like develop something on the side and create like pull requests, you know, features that will get and get merged into the official version. Like, I, how does that work? Lots of questions yet to be answered, but for now, I think we can get started and start playing around a little bit. I'm eager to jump in and do stuff. I was already like, my mind is already racing. I want to maybe recreate my shmup editors in here so I can edit my Pico 8 stuff in Picotron. <laughs> At this point, I would like to give a big shout out and a huge thank you to all the people who are supporting this show on coffee.com. This channel is being supported by people on coffee.com. Uh, the address for that is uh, coffee.com slash lazy devs. Yeah, man, like this was just a tip of the iceberg, right? Like I'm just trying to cover <laughs> as much ground as I can, but it's just so much. There's definitely more, uh, more specialized uh, tutorials that will release in the future. Uh, please do let me know if there is something very vital that I missed out or misunderstood. Uh, post it in the comment section. Also post in the comment sections the things that confuse you that you want to know about because I will do specialized videos, but I need to know which uh, subjects matter the most to you. For now, check out Picotron, go out and have fun with it. See you next time around, guys. Bye. Bye.